waiting for the system to connect to the eye. Here we go. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everyone, to today's webinar entitled Introduction to the Harada Method. I'm Scott Shive, Director of Marketing and Communications for AME, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's presenters are Norman Bodek and Jim Garrick. Mr. Bodek is a, an instructor of the best of Japanese management at Portland State University in Portland, Oregon, and author of seven books, the latest titled The Harada Method, The Spirit of Self-Reliance. Norm was also nominated into the Industry Week's Manufacturing Hall of Fame, started the Shingo Prize, and introduced many lean tools and techniques to American industry. Mr. Garrick is a process improvement advisor for FedEx Express in Memphis, Tennessee. Jim has over 25 years experience concentrated in the areas of lean manufacturing and optimization of the enterprise supply chain. Jim serves on AME's Southeastern Regional Board of Directors, is a Shingle Prize examiner, and importantly for this webinar, a certified Harada instructor at FedEx. Before we start, just a couple of housekeeping items. You will be in a listen-only mode throughout the webinar. You will see that you are muted on your attendee panel on the right side of your screen. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into your question area in the attendee panel and click on Submit. We will review the questions at the end of today's presentation and answer as many as we can. And when you log off today, please check your email inbox. In it will be an invitation link to fill out a short webinar attendee survey. Please take a few minutes to complete it, as your feedback is very important to us to help us improve our future webinar offerings. And Norm and Jim have also graciously agreed to provide a PDF of today's presentation, and we'll be sending that along with a recorded link of the webinar so you can replay it, and then you will receive that no later than Tuesday next week after the weekend. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Norm Bodick and Jim Garrett, who will present Introduction to the Harada Method. Take it away, gentlemen. This is Norman Bodek, <clears throat> and I thank you so much for coming today. Um, Jim, you're there? Yes, sir. And the two of us are so pleased that you're here to share this with you. Um, the Harada Method Workshop. I don't know how many of you know a little bit about the Harada Method and why we think it's unusual, why we think it's so important, and how it could help you and your company in the future. And that's our intention. And what is the problem? It's funny, I was just talking prior to the program with Scott and Jim that very often I go out into the world to teach the Harada Method, or I also teach what's called Quick and Easy Kaizen now, um, this Japanese suggestion system, and I go to a client, I go to people, and I talk about what I know, what I have, what I'm excited about. Well, now I'm excited, you know, about this Harada method, and I want to teach people. But maybe I should stop for a second and find out what is your problem? What do you need? And then see if there's a fit. I mean, if your problem is, well, you're all doing lean, but lean isn't working, absolutely right then maybe this Harada method could help you improve the lean process in your company. That's what I hope. You might have other kinds of problems in your company. We're looking primarily at those problems that relate to people. So I call this pretty much, you know, the human side of lean. And hopefully, because Jim and I are going to be doing the talking, we're not going to be getting interaction from you until the end. We're making, I'm making certain assumptions about what your problems might be. I read this about it was June of last year. The Gallup poll reported, I don't know how many people they interviewed, but it was quite a few thousand, where they said 70% of Americans hate their job or are totally disengaged. 70% of Americans don't like what they do. And of course, this causes high turnover, poor quality, low productivity, etc. I don't know if this is appropriate, but I want to ask you all a question. What is your favorite day of the week? Now be honest, what's your favorite day of the week? I ask this very often, and I normally get Friday. Occasionally, 
somebody gives me another day. But normally it's Friday. We love Friday. Why? Why shouldn't we love every single day? Why shouldn't we get excited when we get up in the morning, Monday morning, and say, wow, it's Monday. I'm so excited to go to work because I really love what I do. Well, I love what I do. And I don't make a distinction between any day. And I want to share it with you. And hopefully, you'll get as excited as I do when I get up Monday morning. Um, whoop, went too fast. I think there are three solutions. Three solutions that came to me just this week to solve this problem of why people hate their job and why Friday is the best day of the week. And I recommend three things that you should consider to look at. One is, can you redesign the job? I visited Lexus uh, a couple of years ago at the Hara plant outside of Nagoya. Very lucky to get in. And it was a beautiful plant, a modern plant in so many ways. I learned so many things going through that plant. But I come up to one worker. And he's underneath the car. And he's stretching overhead, stretching straight up. And his job was to tighten eight bolts in about two minutes, two to three minutes. Had to tighten eight bolts. And I was so surprised to see this at Lexus. And then I went to the supervisor standing by. And I asked him, how long is he going to do this? He says, well, he's going to do it all day. He's going to do every car. We're doing about 300 cars today. And he's going to tighten eight bolts on all of those cars. He's going to do the same thing tomorrow. Maybe the same thing for the rest of the month. Maybe the same thing for the next six months. Couldn't understand this. I couldn't believe it, what I was listening to. Then subsequently in my studies, I found Canon Camera. Canon Camera has people they call supermeisters. And these people make the whole copier. One woman installs 1,000 parts in three hours on her own. In fact, when she finishes a copier, she signs it, signs her name on it, and she says, you know, I feel I just made another baby. I then found subsequently Volkswagen in Dresden, beautiful new modern glass plant. They're making the Phaeton, their expensive automobile. And there's a wonderful video on YouTube. And it shows this worker dressed in white, completely in white, not worrying about grease or anything. And the floor is hardwood. And I watched him work. And he's building a whole subsection of the car, maybe in 20, 30 minutes. And I realized that if we can begin to focus on redesigning work, maybe people will stop hating their job. The second thing I think is a solution to think about is that everybody should have a growth goal. And this is where the Harada method comes in. Everyone coming to work, doesn't matter what you do, doesn't matter what you do, as long as you have an opportunity to grow and to change in the future. And the third thing that also relates to the Harada method is that managers become coaches to develop people. Instead of being bosses and telling you what to do and threatening you, and then you, you're living with such fear that you might get fired tomorrow, managers are there to encourage you, to help you, to guide you, to lead you to be much stronger and better in what you do for the company and in your life. Jim, any comment? It's a good point, Norman. Very good points. <clears throat> this is a video that you might go to look at. I sent it to Jim and some other people. Somebody sent this to me recently. Um, you might be able to write it down. And also, Scott's going to send you a copy of the slide so you have it. It's a, it's a six-minute video. I think it's six minutes. And it's very well done. And it's, on the, it's on, the, on, the, uh, on the concept of engagement. What does it really mean, engaging people? And I think it's a beautiful video that in order to have a successful company, you should fully engage all of your people. And how you do it. I mean, the video was great, but it didn't tell us how do you do it. How do you fully engage people? And that's where I think the Harada method comes in. How do you fully engage people in the process? I'm Norman Bodek. I've been introduced already. And Jim, 
<laughs> so I can skip this and start off with a little bit of a story. About four years ago, four students asked to intern with me. Um, didn't know what to do with them because now I'm working by myself. When I owned Productivity, Productivity Press, I had over 100 people working with me. It was very easy to take an intern. But now, working by myself, I didn't know what to do. So I thought, you know, I have this great map given to me by Shigehiro Nakamura. Now, you get a copy of the map, but if you wanted to blow it up, just contact me at bodek at pcspress.com, and I'll repeat that again, and you'll get a copy of the slides with an email address, and I'm willing to send you a copy that you can blow up. It's a very valuable instrument. Um, and it was produced by a study group headed by Shigehiro Nakamura in Japan. Shigehiro Nakamura, one of my past author, is a great industrial engineer, just incredible. And I said, Shigehiro, you've given me this map. My wife, Noriko, translated it from Japanese. And I would like you to teach my students and myself this map. And he did. It took over a year to do it. This map has 38 lines. This is a manufacturing plant. The idea of this, which I think is very important for you, instead of saying we want to, be, we want to have lean, or we want to do Six Sigma, this map says, I want to be world class in every segment of what I, of what I do. So there's 38 parts. One, one line could be maintenance. Another, another line could be automation. There are 30, we divided the manufacturing facility into 38 parts. I'll show you an example. You could look at the top. These are the first five things shown. It shows quality. The next column says, we want to get zero defects. We want to re reduce our claims, zero claims. We want to have the, the near misses, not only the misses, but the near misses. And design review should be at the development stage to get closer to zero defects. That's what we want to do. And then it says, the second stage are total zero defects, line zero defects, and it says GE6 Sigma. This sort of represents what is being done and who is doing it, like Canon's design in or use of uh, computer automated engineering, I guess, for design. So the first column pretty much says, what is the technique? What do we really want? And the second column says, well, really, who is doing it? Who is doing it in much more detail? Um, you look at morale as an example, the fifth line down. Three improvement ideas per person. Three ideas, improvement ideas per person per week, believe it or not. 150 ideas is one of the world-class companies in Japan are doing. Um, look at the next, which you see, quality and cost. Oh, we did that already. Very good. So let's go down to the next one. That's the second side. I want to get down to the seventh week when I'm meeting with my students. I didn't tell you, Nakamura would meet with us every other Friday for over a year. Students would come to my office, we'd get on Skype, Nakamura's in Tokyo, 8 o'clock in the morning, it's about 4 o'clock in the afternoon here in Vancouver, Washington, and Nakamura was taking one line at a time. And about the 14th week, the seventh line, is the standard manpower. What does that mean, standard manpower? Um, to me, it means there's a best way of doing something, and we want everybody in the plant to do it the best possible way. Toto might call this standardized work. There's a best way of doing it, and everybody should be doing it the best possible way to get the best possible results. The next column says there's a technique called day-to-day -day management by objective. Day-to-day -day manager by objective. I had no idea what that meant, but Nakamura started to explain it to me. Then the next column said Takashi Harada. Now, I've been in Japan, believe it or not, over 80 times. I worked with Shingo and Ono, the creators of Just in Time, or what we call Lean. I met with Nakajima and published his books, who gave us TPM, etc. But I never heard of Takashi Harada. But I was fascinated with what Mr. Nakamura was telling us. And so my wife is Japanese, and three of my four students 
could read Japanese. So we got, my wife got on the internet, went to Amazon Japan, and noticed that Takahashi Harada had written nine books and we ordered all nine books. They came shortly and we divided it between my wife and the three students who could read Japanese and they started to read it, started to teach me about Harada's work. I got so excited, picked up the phone and I called Harada and I said, Mr. Harada, I want to bring your work to America. Because that's what I've done. I've published over a hundred Japanese books in English. And he said, okay. And I got on an airplane with my wife and we flew to Japan. And it's funny because I meet him and I say, Mr. Harada, I want to take one of your books and put it in English. And Mr. Harada says, no. I said, what do you mean no? I just flew 8,000 miles or something like that, you know, six, 8,000 miles to meet you. And he laughed and he says, no, I don't want you to take an old book. I'll write a new book for you. Then I said something I should have said 30 years to Shingo and Ono. I said, Mr. Harada, I want to co-author the book. I want to take what you've done in Japan and rewrite it and put in the American experience. And he said, yes, and that's what we did. Who is Mr. Harada? And why is his method so unique? And why is it so powerful? And why is it called the world's best technique to develop people. Why? I mean, most of us are skeptical when people say things like that, and I wouldn't blame you. Harada's success. Harada was a track and field coach, a junior high school track and field coach in the city of Osaka. It was the worst school in the city. Out of 380 schools, it was the worst. It was the slums of Osaka, if there is such a thing. I mean, Mr. Harada was afraid some days to come to work. It was so bad in the neighborhood surrounding the schools. But he looked at his students and he said, you know, I want you to be the best. And I don't care where you come from. I don't care how poor the conditions are, where you're living. I want you to come to school and I want you to begin to believe in yourself that you could be the best in what you do. And for 20 years, Harada had been a school teacher studying the best techniques all over the world. I mean, he studied Dale Carnegie, he studied Stephen Covey, he studied everybody. He, he's been to Finland, he's been to Shanghai, China. He goes to wherever the best educational systems are to try to find out what is the best possible way to educate, inspire people. And the amazing thing is within the next couple of years, when he consolidated his technique, the students won 13 gold medals. They never won a gold medal before in that school. 13 gold medals. That gold medal meant that that student at that age was the best athlete in their discipline, like javelin or like running. They were the best athlete, not in just in Osaka, but in all of Japan. This is the essence of the Harada method, is it makes winners. He left the school, he left the school system in 2002 to open up a consulting practice in Tokyo and now he's in Osaka. He's trained over 60,000 people at over 300 companies. And in the brief time we have, Jim and I will try to explain what this Harada method is and why it's so unique. Jim, you want to pop in please? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the comment you're, you're making, it you're about to go into, Norman, is that the, uh, the Harada method is a very structured approach, and I think that's 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 its big key for success. Is uh, it, it forces you to to do things, and uh, and and be organized in a way that uh, other methods uh, don't 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 teach. Thank you. Well, just briefly, it teaches you how to be a great leader, how to build great employees in a great organization, and it's rated the world's best. And it's a sports analogy. Since he was track and field coach, he won. Norm, we lost you. This is the key. This line is the key. When you come to work, you're told what to do pretty much. Now you have a certain background, a certain skill, a certain education, 
You want to use it at work, but the boss tells you what to do. This is what the corporation needs, and you do it. Harada's method has you pick your own success goal. Now, hopefully your success goal is in alignment with the company's goal. But remember what I'm saying, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you do as long as you have an opportunity to improve and grow. I don't care if you're tightening eight bolts. As long as you have an opportunity soon to do something else and to learn to build your skills and capabilities. And this is what Harada did. And this is the power of the Harada method, is you pick your own goal. Now, I teach at Portland State. And I say to the students when they come in the first class, how many of you have a goal of what you want to do in your life? And almost nobody raises their hand. Almost nobody raises their hand. Yeah, when I probe them a little bit, they'll say, yeah, I want to graduate. Yeah, I want to get a degree. Once, believe it or not, I was lecturing here in town in Portland at an Apex group. And I said to them, what's your goal? Well, half the people said they want to retire. I love it so much. That was their goal in work is retirement. I'll tell you the truth. I tried it and didn't like it. Another part of the power of the Rada method is to learn how to coach others to be successful. And the key to this process is self-reliance. Self-reliance means you can stand on your own two feet. Self-reliance means you're like a Boy Scout, you know? You're, you're filled with skills. You're truthful, you're, you're, you're obedient, etc. Do you know what I mean? You're self-reliant, you can be fully trusted in the company. Do they fully trust you in your company? When I call AT&T with a problem, you know, some of the, I pick, they pick up the phone or the phone's picked up, and the first thing I get is we're recording this conversation for quality purposes. Why do they do that? Because they feel these people are not fully self-reliant. They're not fully trustworthy. They don't record the telephone conversation of the senior managers or the CEO. Never. They do with the people. Well, I can understand, you know, some people maybe you can't trust. But if you shift the dynamic of your corporation to really developing people to be champions and focus on them being self-reliant, then it's your job to give them the knowledge how to relate to the customer properly. You know, Toyota does this in a very strange way. On the line, there's something called Jadoka. Those of you that are doing lean, I wonder how many of you let your workers stop the line. Very few in America do this. We want to be lean, but we don't let the workers stop the line. But at Toyota, even a new employee can stop the line. That's the level of trust Toyota gives people, the level of respect that they give them. Sure, there's going to be problems, do you know? But they'll solve those problems. So the Harada method, there's three fundamental tools that he developed over the years. One is called the long-term goal setting sheet. This is a marvelous document. This is where you spend time to determine what is your goal. Now, go back to my students at Portland State. None of them have goals. But I tell them, if you want to get a decent grade in this course, you have to get a goal. And this is funny because not too long ago, I taught a company out here called Columbia uh, Columbia Vista Lumber Company in Vancouver, Washington, and I trained 30 of their managers on the Harada Method. And at the end of the class, I looked at them, two and a half day class, and I said, how many of you like the Harada Method? And um, everybody raised their hand. Now in the room, the president was there, Bob Lewis. And um, I said to the, the group, the managers, I said, you all like it, but you're not going to do it. And they all laugh. I said, you all like it, but you're not going to do it. We don't change that easy. We don't change our patterns that easy. The only way you're going to do this is if Bob Lewis, your president, gets up and says to you, you must do it. So Bob got up off his chair, looked around the room, and he said, yes, you must do it. I've made this investment. And Norman, coming here, I love it. You're going to do it. Now, we want people to be self-reliant. But when you go to work, you've got to do what's best for you and best for your company at the same time. So there's nothing wrong with your boss saying you have to do this, which is good for you and good for the company. Another part of the Harada method is the Harada diary. The long-term sheet is where you set your goal, 
you determine all the tasks that you need to do to attain your goal, and then you select out those tasks you want to do on a daily basis. The daily diary is where you write down all the things you have to do on your job, but you also write down, pick a task. What do you have to do to attain your goal? To make sure you're going to do something today to move you on that growth path. And then at the end of the day, you're going to review it. Did I do what I wanted to do? And then this is another key. You're going to meet with your coach. Every single day, you're going to meet with your coach, maybe for only 10 minutes. But the coach is going to sit and look at your diary and say, you know, Harry, that was wonderful what you did today. Hey, Harry, you recognized the problem that you did, but you figured out a way not to repeat the problem. That's wonderful, Harry. You must work with a coach. That's a key. Nike has a similar program out here. They have a mentor-mentee system, and every new employee gets um, a mentor. And they have to meet with the mentor. The mentor is there to help you. If you don't have somebody that you respect that's going to look at what you're supposed to do, you're going to slip back. You're going to say, you know, I'm too tired. I worked so hard today. I'm too tired. I just can't do it. That's the essence of life. And then we have another sheet called the routine check sheet because we want to come up with new habits. Let me take another break. Jim? No, you're exactly right, Norman. I mean, and the key, the key to making the whole thing work is realizing in our daily routines, the things that we do day in, day out, that many times we don't write down or don't recognize, are in many cases destructive to our goals and our ability to accomplish our goals. And that's the great thing about this system is it recognizes that and uh, you see the connection and, and you actually make progress. Thank you, Jim. What You should pop in any time you want, please. These are just, I know it's hard to see, but these are the forms. The first form on the left is something called self-reliance. This is a wonderful test and also I'm willing to send you this test if you'd like to take it to see how self-reliant are you. You score yourself on all of those 33 words from 1 to 10, how reliable are you? How trustworthy are you? Do you know what I mean? How good are you in doing follow-ups and things like that? You rate yourself. I don't look at that. You rate yourself. But then I have you write down, if you're less than 10 on any word, I have you write down what can you do to move you up to 10. What can you move you for me to be more attentive? Maybe I can learn to meditate. Maybe I can get a teacher to help me be more attentive. You write down the things that you want to do to improve in your life. The goal setting sheet, you can see one there completely filled out. That's filled with, and it doesn't take that long to do, really. I mean, I teach this course in a one day. I like to do two and a half days. My favorite is five days, because five days, like Jim came to my course for five days, he's a certified instructor today, and he's going to be doing training at FedEx. Hopefully everybody at FedEx is going to do this system. But this is a wonderful form. You analyze yourself. You look at your past successes. What did I do well in the past that you're very proud of? And you look at your failures. Well, what did I didn't do very well? You know, I look back in my past and I went to graduate school, went to New York University Graduate School of Business, and I did fairly well. I, I got good grades, but I never wrote my thesis. Never wrote my thesis. Well, that to me is sort of a failure. I should have done it. I didn't do it. So I look at the things that I didn't accomplish because I want to be able to repeat the good things I've done in the past, but I also want to overcome the things that I were not too happy about in the past. Then also I want to look at what are the obstacles standing in my way to attain my goal, and then what are the solutions for me to overcome those obstacles. This is interesting. And then in the next group, um, I also look at myself. I look at what do I really want. We ask that question of you. Really, what do you want in life? And we try to put, have you put it in four segments. Top two are tangible. Bottom two are intangible. So on a tangible basis, what do you want from this life? I mean, why, why do you want to be successful? Well, I want to make more money. I want to have more knowledge. Do you know what I mean? I, I want to have a Ferrari. 
I want to have a house in the Caribbean, whatever you want. You can dream it. So I look for me, what I want. Then the, the next one on the left, I look, well, what's tangibly good for my family? This is a very powerful concept. Because if you have a child, and that child needs some medical care, you're going to do everything possible to give that child medical care. If that child has a college education, needs a college education, you'll make the sacrifice that that child gets that college education. This is a wonderful form. The bottom two are intangible. What do I want for myself intangible? I want to feel comfortable in, in, in life, you know what I mean? I want to feel relaxed. I want to feel loved. You know, whatever you want to feel, you indicate it there. And the more you write down, the more important your goal is going to be. In fact, Harada even recommends that you do this first. You write down what you really want for you, your company, your, your, your community, your country, your family. You write it down as many possible things as possible. So you ingrain yourself. This is what I want for my life. Now how am I going to get it? How am I going to get these things? How am I going to make more money? I have to grow. And that's where your goal comes in. Now at Columbia Vista, what they did as a lumber company, because every worker has been taught in this method, not just the supervisors, but every worker is doing this. And um, everyone has a goal. Whoops, sorry, something's ringing. <laughs> Uh, everyone has a goal, and um, everybody works with a coach every day. I thought I turned off the phone. It's a little bit distracting. I apologize. It'll go away, I hope. It went away. Thank you. Then on the bottom, you'll see we pick out 10, ten tasks that we want to do this month. And we pick out 10 routines, routines. Do you know, I want to exercise 30 minutes every day in the morning. I want to meditate 30 minutes every day. Do you know what I mean? I want to read um, texts in my field for 30 minutes every day, etc. You write down all of the things that you want to do to become a whole person and to attain your goal. Then we have other forms. Open window 64 is where you write your tasks. The diary is where you're keeping a schedule of what you do during the day. If you look at that form, the left column shows what I plan for the day, and you plan the whole day. It's funny, you know, we do Hoshin planning for uh, the company. We don't do Hoshin planning for us. <laughs> you write down what you're going to do today, and then at the end of the day, you look at the second column is, did I do what I wanted to do? Simple as that. Over the what? right on top, we write down the task for the day, and then we write down notes. My, my head is always buzzing with notes. And then on the bottom, I like these two sections too, is I write down what are the good things happened today, what are the positive things happened today, who praised me, I write it down. Who said something nice about Norman, I write it down. And if somebody doesn't praise Norman, Harada teaches us we should praise ourselves. We want to reinforce our behavior, that we feel very good about ourselves and very good about our effort. And then there's another box here where I look, well, if I had to do today over again, what would I do? Well, I made a mistake at work. I'm sorry I made a mistake. But if I had today to do over again, this is what I would do so I wouldn't make that mistake. And then the form on the left is just a daily check-off. Did I do the routines I wanted to do? Jim, comment? Well, I think one of the comments you made in the other form is that when companies, especially senior leaders, are struggling or having challenges developing the Hoshin plan, many times it's because the senior leaders themselves have not had this reflection or this discussion, that they have uh, these executives have dissimilar goals or they see the direction of the company and the goals differently and that's okay but this is a great way as you taught us another way to take this tool was to have that exercise and uh, and the senior most senior most leader the CEO CFO uh, SVP 
can gather their staff and have a very fruitful, uh, honest discussion. And in many times, we don't have those discussions. But when, uh, when the senior leader gives them a direction, they all nod their head, they leave the room, and then they wonder why everyone's going off in different directions. And that's because we've never had these kinds of discussions to really understand, both professionally and personally, what are their goals and their objectives? And how can we orchestrate the orchestra to play together rather than making uh, some sound that we're all not happy with? Thank you. And of course, a real key to the system is having a coach, having a mentor. Many years ago, 1960s, I had a data processing company. I was doing very well, making a wonderful living. And since I was doing well, it was my company, I had to play golf. You know, every executive had to play golf back then. So I went to play golf. But I was terrible. Every ball, I hit a shank or a hook. I couldn't hit the ball straight. But it didn't stop me from playing golf. It's funny, I still played. And my ego wouldn't let me take lessons. So my ego wouldn't let me get a coach. Well, after two years, I quit. I, I threw away my golf clubs, threw away the balls. I'll never forget the last time I played was in California. I played eight holes, and I lost nine balls. Eight holes, and I lost nine balls. That was the end of my golf. Well, ten years later, I meet John Schlee. John Schley was a professional golfer, came in second in the U.S. Open, and he won one major, the Hawaiian Open. John wanted to go into business with me. In the morning, I was going to teach lean, and in the afternoon, he was going to teach golf to these executives. I thought it was a great idea. But John said, before we do this, I'm going to show you how to play golf. And he took me out to the golf course, took me out to the golf range. We spent one hour together. At the end of the hour, every single ball I hit went straight. Maybe not 300 yards, maybe not 200 yards, but every ball went straight. All of the hooks and shanks were gone. Amazing. Can you imagine how stupid I felt that I never had a coach earlier in my life? Now let's go in our companies. Every CEO that I've ever met, and I've met many, many CEOs, every one of them has coaches, you know? They have Bain and Company, they have Booz Allen and Company, they have Proudfoot, they have so many coaches that come to them. I mean, these CEOs really don't breathe without talking to one of their coaches. And yet now, look at everybody else in the workplace. We don't have coaches. We don't have people that will help us develop ourselves the way we should. This is just an example of a form. You might be able to see this all filled out. Um, what skills does the Harada method improve? Well, I don't have that much time to go into detail of this, but you'll see it. It's analytical skills, enterprise skills, and leadership skills. We spend time looking at each one of these that you can analyze yourself to see how well are you doing, and then how could you improve it. And the key we mentioned is self-reliance. And what does it mean? being self-reliant, standing on your own two feet. And Arana likes this. He says a self-reliant person is like an empty glass waiting to be filled. Think about this from this brief uh, one-hour uh, course together about are you an empty glass? I'll tell you I meet very few empty glass people. I meet people that are filled with themselves that always tell me everything, but very few people listen. They'll listen to conversation about football or baseball, about politics, about things in the news, you know, silly things that we can't really control. But if I start to try to teach them things, I get immediate reactions that they're going to teach me what they know about the subject. And they're not really staying empty to learn. This is a very powerful lesson to think about. Are you like an empty glass? Self-directing person is determined to achieve goals, is a good habit creator, is a highly skilled in what they do, is a strong believer in the importance of balancing one's spirit, skill, physical strength, and lifestyle at the sources of human power. One of Harada's students, a young lady, just won a gold medal. 
and she's standing on the platform and she's being interviewed. The interviewer says, what did you do to win a gold medal? And she said, well, I thank Mr. Harada for being my teacher, but I think I really won the gold medal because I washed dishes at home every night. Now, what does washing dishes at home every night have to do with winning a gold medal? This is curious. Mr. Harada found that as a teacher, when he focused first on building people's spirit, getting them to believe in themselves, getting them to pick goals for their lives, getting them to start to feel good about their possibility of what they can be in their life, he thought that was enough to make winners but he got no winners. Then he added a new program to develop their skills. He had them study, you know, the javelin. Well, who's the best javelin thrower in the world? And what did they do? And let's look at their videos and see what you can do to improve your skills. And we worked on that, and he still got no winners. Then he said the third thing is let's look at their health conditions. Let's look at their physical strength and see if we can build them up. And so he looked at their diets. He got them to exercise properly. He got them to build up those kinds of muscles that they need to achieve that skill. Still, he got no winners. None. No gold medals. And then he looked at their lifestyle. And he said, look where they live. You know, they come to school for seven hours a day, and the rest of the time they're living in that environment. Well, how can you change that environment? He could go to the house and tell the mother to clean up the kitchen, but no, that doesn't work. But he got the students to become more responsible for the home environment. And so this woman said, I wash dishes every night. That's a beginning to show I'm participating in the well-being of my family. Also, if I wash dishes, and Harada says you've got to do this for a thousand days, I will ingrain myself. I will be disciplined to do what I have to do to succeed in life. And so washing dishes both served the family and gave her the sense of discipline that she needed to overcome all the obstacles standing in the way of her achieving her goal. I want you to think about that. Because as soon as Harada put in this lifestyle, he ended up with the students winning 13 gold medals. Not only that, but the school became the number one school out of 380 schools in track and field. It went from the worst to the best when the method was put together. The worst to the best when we put this method all together. And it stays the best. That school is still the highest rated school in Osaka for the last 12 years in a row. And the school not only was uplifted athletically, but also academically. This concept built up the spirit in students, their discipline, that most of them now go to high school, which they didn't go to before. And many, many, many get into college. And many, many of them have really begun to be successful in life. Success comes from setting goals that one firmly believes one should try to achieve and executing the plan within a desired time frame. So the key that we're trying to deliver today is how can you set up an environment where you are, where everybody starts to pick goals that they firmly believe in and they really want to achieve and executing the plan within a desired time frame. What they did at Columbia Vista Lumber Company, by the way, is they set up a certification program. They certified all of the skills within the company. And then they set up a series of tests for people to learn, to study, and to take tests to become certified at a, as a higher skilled employee in the company. This gave the employees an opportunity to pick a goal for them, that was meaningful because if they become certified, they're an expert in that field. They're going to get more money working in that company and look at the self-worth that they now have. Jim? I think you're exactly right, Norman. I think it's, it's very important that everyone realize that uh, once, once you uh, 
that community service, the service to others, it, it sets it sets the mindset, and uh, it. it uh, it, it makes you continually improve and, and work uh, to be better, and I think it's it's a key piece that's not always uh, presented in other coaching methods. Yeah, what I'm sorry about with this methodology, with this technology, is I can't see you. You know, it's very hard for me just talking to a screen like on the telephone. I'm okay. But I'm so much better if we got on Skype or if you come into a classroom and we can begin to interact with each other so that I'm addressing things that really interest you and you begin to understand why Norman and Jim are so excited about this Harada method. It works. Scott, is it time for us to start to ask questions of people, see if they want to come in and ask some questions? That would be fine. If any of you out there have questions, please submit them through your uh, question panel on your control panel. Um, one of the comments that was made early on by one of our attendees when you were talking about customers is the reason why organizations record calls when you call in for customer service is they don't trust their customers, which I think is uh, right on the money and a very insightful comment. They don't trust the customer. All right. Yeah, but when you call when you call a manager, you know they don't recall the calls. What's the difference? You know why? I just think, you know, it's a pattern that all many companies do, and we accept it. But I'm asking you to challenge that acceptance, challenge that idea. If we made people self-reliant, if we got them to really work on improving themselves, then we can fully trust them. And hopefully they don't do anything that would be detrimental to our organization. I hope not. But it's a good question. Anybody else, please? Yeah, we don't have any other questions at the moment. We'll just there. Yeah, one just came in. Hang on there. How often do you meet with your coach and mentor? Well, you know, if if you're involved in any athletic program, that coach is always available. They're watching you. You know especially today in any kind of college or professional sports. You're meeting every day with your coach. And so at Nike, you're meeting, you're meeting your mentor every single day. And, and I like this Arata system. You're meeting every day just for a few minutes. And so I have, I have past students. I have one is a president of a company in Winnipeg, and another one is a, is a CEO of a company in Winnipeg. And these two people came down, took the workshop with me, and they send each other their daily diary every single day. And there's a process that we teach how to be a coach, you know, how to give positive reinforcement, how to give the right questions so that you're not getting people negative in any way, and you know how to be a really good coach. I mean, Bobby Knight could have been successful at the University of Indiana, but I don't like his style. I don't like throwing chairs. I don't like screaming at people. I think there's a better way to encourage people to do better at work. And so it only takes a few minutes every day to go through that form, the daily diary form, and to be available to this person who might have questions that they need. We have it somewhat between a worker and a supervisor, but the supervisor normally is not trained to be a coach. Supervisor is very often to be a boss because the focal point of the supervisor is to get the work done. And the focal point of a coach is to develop people to get the work done. There's a subtle but very powerful difference. Thank you. Another question, please. Building off of that question, do you define a coach and a mentor as the same? Um, I do. Jim, you have any comment? Well, I think it's important, Norman, that if you, you, you pick, you establish that, say, that mentoring relationship, that, that you establish one with someone who has the skills and the knowledge and, and someone who you can ultimately respect. Uh, and, and again, building on what Norman said, whether you're at Nike or you're at Zappos, which is also a great coaching organization, is, is picking, picking that person uh, that, that's, that's best for you. Uh, some companies try to assign someone to you, 
and that's not always the best because you need you need someone again who you could trust, someone who you can you can have uh, very open and frank discussions, and also someone who's willing to give you open and frank feedback. Uh, you know, sugarcoating the feedback isn't going to help you become a better person. And then building well, off of that, how, how, do, how do you christen a coach? What's the process for developing a coach? Well, what we do in my workshop, um, I teach the Rada method in the first three days. The fourth day, the students in the class get up and they do the teaching. They go over the whole concept and they teach for a full day so we can get a chance to review their style, etc. Then the last day, we become coaches. So we break up into pairs. Two people coach each other and then we go through the Harada method of learning how to give positive reinforcement. I like the B.F. Skinner behaviorist concept. I like the positive reinforcement. Do you know, you, you keep, you can find a way without being critical. Criticism could close people so easy they'll never open again. I don't like the word devil's advocate. You know, I don't like the devil at all. And if any devil advocates out there, change your style. I like to give people positive reinforcement because through that direction, they can recognize where they need to improve on their own because if you're patting them on the back about something and not on something else, they begin to recognize they have to work on the other thing. You have to be very subtle and to be a very good coach of people. What Chugai Pharmaceutical does in Japan, one of Harada's clients, is every new employee gets a mentor and this mentor is normally somebody that's been there a few years, somebody that has the skills in a similar position as the person just joining the company and they meet with the worker at least for one year. They act as a coach for at least one year. It could go beyond, but it's a minimum of one year. This company used the Harada method, and they haven't had a single turnover in the last number of years. Not a single person has left the company. They used to have considerable turnover until they started the Harada method. Any other question, please? Yeah, I think the other more. point. Go ahead, Jim. I was going to say the other point, uh, Norman, that you do uh, after your training is there's a 30-day period where we're actually uh, being coached under Norman uh, by sending in our, our daily diaries. Typically, also Norman, uh, through his network, will uh, offer opportunities uh, to connect you with other uh, masters uh, around the world. And so that's also uh, something else that Norman uh, did when he was when I was going through the training and found very useful. Thank you. Yeah, thank I've, been you very, I've been very lucky, you know, because, I mean, years back I was not a good teacher at all, not good at all, until I started to teach this Arata method. And from Mr. Arata, I just keep improving every possible way. And I'm very grateful that all of my students like, like what I do. And I teach at different levels. I teach... Uh, my students in Portland State. I teach in my certification workshop here in Portland. And I was lucky enough to be invited to Germany and Spain beginning of the month. Went to a company called Festo. They're an automation company in, um, outside of Stuttgart, Germany. And then I spent um, um, a week in Spain at Madrid, Sevilla, and Valencia and I was able to teach there and I had a wonderful time in, in Europe. I love Europe. I love the food and I love to go to the museums. What an amazing art. Um, any other question before we break? Yeah, a couple more questions. How many goals do you establish and work on at any given time? Okay, now it's up to the individual but you know you could have many goals. It's not just one thing in life. Let's go back here, you know. I want to increase sales by 10% from last year from the same half period. I want to increase customer satisfaction by 20%. I want to make three new business plans, you know. I want to make no mistakes in data input for 60 working days. I want to put into practice 30 action plans out of the initially planned 50 in total to improve workplace relationships. So 
goals could be at various different levels. I like a life goal. If you read my book, The Harada Method, I interview a son of one of my clients at CIBC Bank in Canada. And Jonathan was 11 years old. Jonathan heard about me from his father and then wanted to speak to me. So we spoke on the phone. And I said to Jonathan, what do you want to be in your life? And Jonathan said, I want to be a bone surgeon. 11 years old, he wants to be a bone surgeon. Well, that's amazing. I never had, as a child, any goal. If I had any goal, it was to get out of school, because I hated school. Didn't have a goal. And without a goal, you don't know where you're going. You know, you don't, you need a plan, you need a goal. You need something that's going to get you excited. So when you get up Monday morning, you know what I mean? You're so excited to go to work. Now, think of work. Doesn't matter what you do. Think of work. Now, think of this. A great artist, a great pianist. I mean, he could practice eight hours a day. Eight hours a day. And it's all routine. I mean, it's hitting those keys over and over and over and over and over and over again. A lot of repetition. But he also has the opportunity, a small percentage of him is very, very creative from that repetition. And that's what's missing at work. People do these repetitive things, not, not bad, but they're missing the creative opportunity to focus on something that they want to do in their life to enrich their life. They want their companies to be successful, of course. But they also want to figure out what they want in this life, you know? We want our companies to be successful. We want to make this a much, much better world for all of us. Anyone else? A question. How do you ensure that the goals people pick are attainable? We want to set people up for success. Yes, absolute excellent question. How do they know we're attainable? Well, who knows better than the individual? Is it up to me, do you know what I mean, to decide it for you? That's what happens now. I decide for you of what you should do in your life. I want you to pick something that you're going to be excited about. You'll do the planning. And, Scott, you know, they can shift. As they're learning and growing, they might, you know, direct it slightly different. But I recommend you want to be a doctor, at least give yourself a chance to become a doctor. And it's attainable. You know, my wife, Noriko, um, I met her 30 years ago. She translated my first Japanese book into English. She was a translator. Then she was invited to work at Florida Power and Light in the quality department, and so she became a quality manager. Then she decided later on in life she wants to be a doctor. Imagine. And she went back. I won't tell you how old she is. She'll get mad at me. <laughs> but she went back and became a doctor. You know, we are capable of so many amazing things. So don't worry about picking the wrong thing. Pick what you feel that you really want. Go through the exercise of what you, what's good for you, what you want. You know what I mean? What's good for your family, what's good for your company, what's good for society, and then pick something that you can get excited about. Jim? I would agree, Norman. I think that's, that's the most important part is we have to find that alignment between the person and their goals and objectives, the company, what their goals and objectives are, and find that alignment. And, as, and sometimes we just have, you know, people doing the wrong kinds of jobs, uh, people not always in, in the right places, or and sometimes the people are in the wrong companies. And that's okay. It's at least you can identify that and you can work through it. Uh, but uh, just to uh, go through the motions and not adding really any value to anyone, this doesn't help the company, and it doesn't help the person. We have two more questions, uh, Jim and Norm. The uh, next one is, there are so many companies out there teaching coaching skills. Any suggestions for the best? Jim? I would say, you know, we've looked at a number of, of uh, different methodologies that this one is, is a very solid methodology. I would say that uh, uh, and I've teased Norman about this, I would say the, the only negative is it takes work. And Norman's response is, so does most all good things in life take work. So uh, 
that's 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 the positive as well. If if, if the methodology is good and rigorous, it takes work, just like uh, any kind of exercise program or any kind of learning program. You got to stick with it, and uh, and you will grow. Uh, so. Uh, I would say pick one that, that fits your company and pick one that, that uh, helps you uh, grow as an individual, grow as an organization. Yeah. Last night was Chinese New Year's. So I went to dinner, friends of my wife and some Chinese people, and there was a young lady. She was 17 years old from China, from Shanghai. Never met her before, but she was a friend of our friends. And she spoke per perfect English. I said, how did you learn perfect English in China? And then she said the following. She said, you know, um, because Shanghai, in a, in a survey recently, was picked as the highest educational system in the world was Shanghai. What are they doing in Shanghai to be rated the best in the world in all of these skills. And she said, my school starts at 7 o'clock in the morning, finishes at 5 o'clock at night. I come home and I have dinner, and I go back to work sometimes to 1 o'clock in the morning. And I do that six days a week. Now just imagine that. The intensity, and this girl was absolutely brilliant. I mean, 17 years old, she knew calculus, you know what I mean? She knew so many things that I still don't know going through, I don't know, seven, eight years of college. Think of the intensity that they go through to succeed in the world. And now you say to yourself, well, is it worth it? Should we put our children into such intense learning programs to succeed in life? And I just think, you know, you just have to do what you have to do to survive well. I've got criticized. You know, somebody criticized me recently. They said, Henry Ford cut back the work week to 40 hours a week. Oh, back, I don't know, 1920-something, to 40 hours a week for people. And he thought it was so good that people only have to work 40 hours a week. Well, I don't have that privilege. I guess I'm a slow learner, and I have to work very, very hard to try to succeed well in this life. And I'm so grateful for the kind of life that I've had. And I have this doctor to take care of me. But it's, just think about this Chinese girl and what she goes through and how we in America, how are we going to compete with China when they put this intensity into the youth so that they could be successful in life. One final one question. question. I don't know if this will take a lot of time, but it's um, could you walk us through the Open 64 form? Yeah, sure. The 64 form, it takes a little bit of time to, to go through this. Um, but here it is. Um, it's simple as this. Once you decide your goal, in the center, even though we call it an open window 64, there are really 81 boxes here. 81 boxes. It's eight groups. It's actually nine groups of nine. 81. The center group of nine, right in the center is my goal. Well, my goal now is to be the best Harada teacher in the world. I want to be as good as Harada or even better. Then the eight squares around that center is where I put eight areas or aspects. Well, in order to be the best Harada method, what do I have to do? Well, one area, I have to study. I have to learn and study everything about Harada. I have to see how many, how many of his books I can get translated from Japanese to English. I have to send him lots of questions. I have to study Stephen Covey. I have to study other people that have been successful teachers of others. And then I want, if I want to be successful, I have to learn how to market. So another box would be marketing. Another box would be, well, I have to learn how to present. Another box would be, I have to write. I have to write articles. I have to write books. Harada insists on one that you put family in one of those boxes. You're going to serve your family at the same time. So I come up with eight areas of interest. Then 
I take one of those areas, like study, and I move it over to the left nine boxes, and I put in the center study. Of those nine, I put study. And then there are eight boxes around that, and that's where I put my task specifically. What am I going to study? When am I going to do it? I want to put dates in there. When am I going to do it? When am I going to start? When am I going to finish? And so I put in the area, I hope you can visualize this, in the middle of those groups of nine. And then around it, I put specific, ta what do I have to do? It's just like a Hoshan planning. What do you have to do? And when do you have to do it? And who, what help do I need, et cetera? And you come up. It normally takes people about 33 minutes to come up with 64 tasks. Not difficult. I, I get it almost every one of my classes. In this example, I should have picked a better one because we're missing a few. <laughs> it's not as complete as it should have been. You're setting up a road map. When you're going somewhere, you know where you're going. That's your goal. And then you have all of the things that you have to do and when you have to do it. When I know that, then I take out the first 10. What do I want to get started with? And I put that into my daily. I put it into my goal setting sheet, and then I might take one to do today, or maybe two to do today. That's all, because I can't do everything today. And I do step by step. My last comment. Went to Japan in 1981 because started a company called Productivity, and America's growth rate was in decline and the Japanese had the highest growth rate in the world. And I wanted to find out what the Japanese were doing. And so I went to Japan to try to figure out what they were doing. And then this miracle process just took over, do you know? I was able to meet Dr. Shingo, Mr. Ono, and those that gave us the lean process. And now I feel I've found the best method in the world to develop people, or what we call the human side of lean. I mean, how many of you are doing lean, and how many of you are really successful in lean, and proud of what you're doing in lean? And maybe this erotic method is something that you should be looking into to further your efforts. And I thank you, Scott, very much for having us. And I thank you, Jim, for participating with me. And I wish you all that have stuck through and listened, I wish you all very well. Take care, all of you. Thank you, Norm and Jim, for a very insightful presentation. This brings our webinar to a close. Our next webinar is scheduled for February 27th, titled Taking Lean Beyond Cost Reduction to Top Line Growth. Please visit ame.org slash webinars for more information and to register. And don't forget to fill out the short survey that will be in your inbox. Thanks, everyone, for attending today, and have a productive day.